Good evening, I'm David Kramer with Alaska Weather. As always, please visit our website, weather.gov slash Alaska. You can get updates to the forecast or check out any watches, warnings, or advisories that we might have out for your area. You can also call our weather info line, 1-800-472-0391. Get any updates to the forecast through that means as well. And you can email me at the address at the bottom of the screen, david.kramer at noaa.gov. Starting off with our fire danger slide here, we can see up on the north slope, we do have in the central and western location some high fire danger. And down in the Bettles area, we have some fire danger as well as we get out into the Yukon Flats area where we will also have some extreme danger out there. And then down in the central portions of the interior down by Fairbanks, some high fire danger and the northern portions of Lynn Canal up by the Haines and Skagway areas, we are also going to have some high fire danger. Taking a look now at our satellite imagery, we can see several waves moving through the area, including one that's down by Kodiak Island, bringing some cloud cover and rain to the area, extending a wave out further into the Gulf of Alaska. We can see another system moving through the northern part of the Bering Sea, extending some cloud cover out towards the uh, Pribilof Islands area. And as we look further to the south, we can actually see some high pressure down by the eastern Aleutian Islands. You can notice the darker cloud cover that's out by much of the Aleutian Islands underneath that higher cloud cover that's the lighter color. We can see a lot of that stratus and fog that's been plaguing the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands area. And then finally, we can look out over the southeastern portions of the state where we do have some low cloud cover out there as well, with the system pushing in from the west. Taking a look now at our weather for the remainder of the day, we'll start off with our high pressure that's out over the eastern Aleutian Islands extending into the Bering Sea, expecting fog underneath that for the Aleutians and throughout much of the Bering Sea and west coast of the state. Some areas in the more northern locations of the Bering and along the west coast to include the Alaska Peninsula are going to mix with rain and with that fog. And then we're going to have some rain showers extending further inland for southwest Alaska and Kodiak Island and then up into the south central area as well, especially those northern locations of south central Alaska. As we get into southern locations of the interior expecting to see some afternoon and evening thunderstorms that's going to extend up just to the east of the Yukon Flats area however we do have high pressure out over the Arctic coastline keeping a lot of the shower activity out at bay up there down in the Panhandle area some isolated light showers particularly in the northern and southern locations with the central area being a little bit lighter in terms of showers as we move into tonight some light showers will remain over the Panhandle area uh, pretty light along the North Gulf Coast and in South Central Alaska as well. With our troughing moving into the interior, we will have some showers continuing for southern places of interior Alaska down into the Alaska Range and northern places of South Central. Those showers will also extend down to southwest Alaska where we'll start to mix with fog as we get closer towards the water. Then out over the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands with high pressure remaining in place, we are expecting a continuation of fog with a lot of mix with rain from much of the Bering Sea to include the Pribilof Islands. Fog continuing up the west coast of the state through the Kotzebue Sound area and then up along the Arctic coastline as well for tonight. As we move into Tuesday, continuing to see high pressure up along the Arctic coastline, keeping a lot of the precipitation further to the south, but we will have some rain down the west coast of the state, southwest Alaska, much of south central, and much of the interior. As we get into uh, central and eastern locations of the interior, expecting to see afternoon and evening thunderstorms, those thunderstorms are going to extend into the Alaska range down into the to down into the Talkeetna Mountains with a chance for some isolated thunderstorms further south in the Talkeetna Mountains. Down in the Panhandle area, we're expecting to see more widespread rain showers and Tuesday, and then way out by the Aleutians, we are going to continue to see our high pressure out over the area, continuing to see fog over much of the Bering and Aleutian Islands with areas that are mixing with rain as well. Finally, as we move into Wednesday, that high pressure remaining out over the Bering with that ridging extending out through much of the Bering down through the eastern Aleutian Islands, continuing to see fog for all of the Aleutians, the Alaska Peninsula, and along much of the southwest coastline, mixing with rain for those eastern portions of the Bering and for the Aleutian Islands. We do have another system approaching from the south, starting to make its way, but getting stuck up on that ridge, not quite making it into the Aleutians on Wednesday. 
Out over mainland Alaska, we're going to have rain along the southwest coastline extending up into western and southern portions of mainland Alaska, where we will see some more widespread rain here on Wednesday. As we get into the interior, we're going to see some thunderstorms through much of the interior for central and eastern portions, as well as up into the central and eastern parts of the Brooks Range. However, as we get north of the Brooks Range along the north slope, high pressure will dominate the area, keeping those showers further to the south. We are going to see more widespread rain also down in the Panhandle area, sandwiched between two low pressure systems out in the area. Taking a look at our temperatures for Tuesday morning, starting off in the Panhandle area, dropping down to the lower 50s for most locations in the Panhandle, lower 50s to around 50 degrees for much of South Central Alaska, and mid 50s as we move up into the interior. Up along the Arctic coastline into the mid 30s for most locations, a little bit warmer out west, and then mid 40s for all along the west coast of the state, down into the Bristol Bay area where temperatures will drop down into the upper 40s there. Mid 40s for the Alaska Peninsula through the Aleutian Islands and the Pribilofs. Then on Tuesday afternoon, temperatures getting up into the 50s for the Aleutians, getting up into the 60s for the Bristol Bay area, 50s along the west coast, a little bit cooler there in the Seward Peninsula area, but increasing with the high temps out through the interior portion of the state where we'll get into the 70s for central locations in the interior, into the 40s along the Arctic coastline, into the 60s for much of south central, and right around 60 degrees for the Panhandle. Wednesday morning, temperatures dropping back down to the lower 50s for the Panhandle and for south central Alaska in the mid to upper 40s for much of southwest Alaska, right around 50 for the interior portion of the state into the 30s along the Arctic coastline. Down for southwest Alaska into the Alaska Peninsula, dropping down into the mid to upper 40s, and that's going to be true for much of the Aleutians as well, a little bit colder out by Shimia down to 43 degrees. And finally, as we look at our Wednesday afternoon highs, staying out in the Aleutian Islands, getting up to around 50 degrees, uh, getting warmer as we get further to the east, as we get into the Alaska Peninsula, it's going to be mid to upper 50s and then into the 60s for the Bristol Bay area. Into the 50s for the YK Delta, up into the Norton Sound area, into the 40s for much of the Seward Peninsula, and then into right around 40 degrees for the Arctic coastline. Up to the 70s for the uh, interior, into the 60s for South Central Alaska, and finally for the Panhandle, getting up into the lower to mid 60s. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. For our aviation section, we'll start off with a look at our flying weather on Tuesday morning. Starting off over the Bering Sea, widespread IFR conditions are expected. However, as we get to the Aleutian Islands, a mixture of MVFR conditions will be there as well. Those MVFR conditions are going to extend into much of the west coast of the state to include some of the IFR conditions right along the water's edge through areas as far north as the Seward Peninsula. But the MVFR conditions are going to move into western portions of the interior. However, as we get to central and eastern places in the interior, expecting conditions to improve to VFR. Along the Arctic coastline, MVFR and IFR conditions are expected, as well as down in south central Alaska with the worst conditions out by the water. Down in the Panhandle area, MVFR conditions for most locations. However, as we get closer towards the Gulf and in areas further to the south, we are expecting IFR conditions to dominate. Tuesday afternoon, conditions are going to improve in some of the areas of the Panhandle, improving to MVFR for much of the area, and VFR conditions in the northern portions of the Lynn Canal area. MVFR conditions also along the North Gulf Coast, but much of the rest of South Central Alaska should be VFR. VFR conditions continuing for central and eastern portions of the interior. However, western portions down into Southwest Alaska and all along the west coast of the state still going to be MVFR conditions with some of those conditions moving up to the Arctic coastline as well. And some isolated areas of IFR conditions along the west coast nearest to the water. Down in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, widespread MVFR and IFR conditions are expected. Wednesday morning, continuing to see MVFR and IFR conditions for the Bering Sea, primarily IFR for the Aleutian Islands, and extending those IFR areas into much of the west coast, especially through the YK Delta and Norton Sound areas, then pushing MVFR conditions further to the east through much of south central Alaska, and starting to make their way into central locations of the interior, as well as through the Brooks Range and along the Arctic coastline, with IFR conditions also along the Arctic coast. Eastern portions of the mainland still going to be VFR, and we are going to have some areas of IFR conditions along the North Gulf Coast and for the central and southern locations of the Panhandle. However, northern locations will continue to see VFR conditions. For Wednesday afternoon, continuing to see VFR for northern places of the Panhandle, especially northern parts of the Lincoln Canal area. Otherwise, we're going to see MVFR conditions down in the Panhandle, extending up the North Gulf coastline through much of South Central Alaska, excluding the Copper River Basin. However, some areas are going to see IFR through Prince William Sound, much of the Kenai Peninsula, and right around the Anchorage Bowl area. Into the interior portions of the state, eastern portions of the mainland going to continue to be VFR, and then MVFR conditions moving further to the west, and eventually IFR conditions right along the west coast of the state. 
MBFR and IFR also along the Arctic coastline, and then down in the Bering Sea, MBFR and IFR conditions are expected, with primarily IFR conditions for the Aleutians. Looking through the passes, starting up north at Anaktuvik, VFR conditions are expected on Tuesday, as well as at Adigan. Moving down into the Alaska Range Lake, Clark and Merrill will both start off and stay marginal throughout the day on Tuesday, as well as at Raining Pass. Windy Pass will also be marginal throughout the day. Isabel Pass will be VFR throughout the day, and Mentasta will start off marginal and improve to VFR in the afternoon. Tinea Pass will start off IFR, jump all the way up to VFR in the afternoon, as well as at Portage. And then Chilkoot and White will both start off marginal, improving to VFR later in the day. For our freezing levels, we have a pocket of cooler air just to the east of the northeastern part of mainland Alaska. Then we have some warmer air coming in by the western Aleutians, with freezing levels getting up to as high as 16,000 feet just to the south of the islands. Looking at our icing, two areas of icing not really over uh, mainland Alaska, but uh, pretty near St. Lawrence Island area just to the west out over northeast Russia, above 7,000 feet there. And then just to the east of mainland Alaska, above 7,000 feet over northwest Canada. For our jet stream, starting off over the Bering Sea with the strongest branch of the jet, moving out of a westerly direction uh, between St. Matthew Island and the Pribilof Islands, 95 knots expected there. Branching then, one branch moving up to the north and one to the south, the northerly one moving over the Seward Peninsula out of a southerly direction around 60 knots, and the other branch, the more southerly one, moving over the Alaska Peninsula out of a northwesterly direction, 50 knots there. Also at 50 knots, we have a northwesterly component of the jet moving through the central portion of the mainland out through south central Alaska at 50 knots, and then right all along the east coast of the state, northerly wind 65 knots expected there. Down in the southern portions of the panhandle, westerly flow of 40 knots is expected. At 9,000 feet, not much activity over the panhandle. Over eastern portions of mainland Alaska, northerly winds 30 knots expected there. Strongest winds out over the central bearing, 35 to 45 knots out of the west, moving in over Nunavik Island, and then veering, moving out over the Alaska Peninsula, around 30 knots out of a northerly direction. Down to 3,000 feet, strongest winds out over the Alaska Peninsula area, going through the gaps at 35 knots out of the northwest, and then 30 to 35 knots out of the westerly direction over the central bearing. For turbulence only out over Kodiak Island and the Alaska Peninsula below 5,000 feet is expected, extending up towards the Barren Islands area. Guys, got everything tied down back there. Yeah. Yep. We're going through the lee of uh, Saint Elias, so there might be some turbulence. Fasten seatbelt sign on. Well, who am I to tell you what to do? There are tens of thousands of glaciers in Alaska. Some stunning cliffhangers. Others, wide glaciers that come down to meet the ocean tides. Some, like this one we flew over in August, are easily visible from low Earth orbit and are mesmerizing from a thousand feet above and have trees growing on top of their soil-laden boundaries. Those glaciers, although they represent only a fraction of the world's ice, are contributing much more than their share to sea level rise. Chris Larson and his colleagues have repeatedly measured 220 of them in a small single-engine otter, measuring their height with lasers and their depth with radar, and watching them change from season to season and year to year. But Alaskan glaciers are also different. We're only just figuring out how they all behave. Data from flights like these, part of NASA's Operation Icebridge, can help fill the gaps. Chris and radar specialist Martine Trufer are both from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and both seasoned Alaskan pilots. But they rely on their good friend and legendary bush pilot 
Paul Kloss and his 35,000 hours in the cockpit to fly the incredibly demanding flight lines the mission requires. And does it help you guys being pilots too? I would like to think so, but uh, watching Paul fly and seeing what he does, it's kind of like trying to learn quantum mechanics in kindergarten. You know, I, I can fly my airplane around, but just seeing what Paul does in this extremely challenging environment in the mountains while trying to follow a specific flight line at a specific altitude above ground, negotiating winds, topography, um, maybe occasional low-level clouds that you have to get around and just managing all that is, is just several levels above what I could do as a pilot. Well, I think the first time I came here to this park, I was probably four years old with my father. I've been blessed to be able to fly in lots of places in the world, all over the place, actually, uh, almost every continent. I guess I'm always looking for some place that might be better than this, but I haven't found it. <laughs> Paul's plane is about 60 years old and is the first single engine Otter ever retrofitted with a 1,000 horsepower engine, which makes takeoffs feel effortless and gives Paul the ability to negotiate wild terrain, which he certainly did during the first two incredible science flights of this campaign. And with sunny skies and relatively calm air, we covered three vastly different pieces of ice. While Paul fueled up the plane, Chris gave us a preview of the day's science and scenery. So it has one of the greatest coastal reliefs anywhere in the world. So it's between the ocean and the summit of Mount St. Elias, which is 18,008 feet high. It's uh, less than 10 miles. There's a stupendous amount of mountain right off the ocean. It's, it's hard to beat it anywhere in the world. Uh, it might be the prettiest for me. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, absolutely stunning. From here in McCarthy, we'll cross one of the bigger precipitation gradients in Alaska, too. Here it's uh, about 10 inches of uh, precipitation a year, and we'll go over to an area where it's uh, on the order of 200 inches per year. So it's from one of the driest parts of Alaska to one of the wettest parts of Alaska in about 45 minutes of flight time. Wow, that's pretty good. That's awesome. You want to do Tyndall next? Sure. There you are. If the winds are calm now, might as well grab it. <laughs> First, we came to the rugged landscape of Icy Bay, which not that long ago wasn't a bay at all. It was filled with ice. Tidewater glaciers in this region can make dramatic advances and retreats as they feed on high rates of snowfall and then retreat as they're melted by warm ocean waters. Like the Tyndall Glacier seen here, most of these glaciers have retreated dramatically over the last hundred years. But nearby Yahtzee Glacier, after years of retreat, is currently the most rapidly advancing glacier in Alaska. Overall though, the Ice Bridge Alaska surveys from the Denali region in the north to the Juneau Ice Field in the southeast have documented pretty substantial thinning of glacial ice. Areas seen here in orange and red show between about 10 and 15 feet of thinning per year. It's a nice waterfall up there from the hanging ice. We very first started profiling this fall. This gravel fan in the one in the valley next to it didn't exist. All yeah, the, I was going to say, this was look deep. at all the good landing spots here. Yeah, there's no place to land here before. No, it was deep water. After covering several of Icy Bay's glaciers, given that it was time for lunch, just like that, we landed in this unforgettable spot. Flying eastward, leaving Icy Bay behind, we came to the mighty Malaspina, one of the Earth's great examples of a Piedmont glacier that spills out like pancake batter onto a broad plain as it approaches the sea. It surges at uneven intervals, creating dramatic patterns on its surface as it distorts the moraines of rock and soil borne along by the glacier. The Malaspina is less dynamic than the Yahtzee and is only melting at about the average rate for Alaska. 
but that could change quickly. It has the potential for being one of the bigger geographic evolutions in Alaska. Certainly, my son will be able to witness some big geography changes there. There's potential for it being connected with the ocean through some narrow lagoons, uh, estuaries, which would take a little bit of coastal erosion, but it's, it's not too hard to imagine that where the Malaspina Glacier is now could become a large bay. The data that Martin's radar provides could reveal how vulnerable the Malaspina is to melting by the nearby ocean. Here we see the radar returns from the surface of the glacier. And here is something that Chris's lasers can't see, the rocky bed of the glacier, giving us both clues as to what's happening under the ice, as well as a measurement of its thickness. Finally, we came to the Yakutat ice field, 300 square miles of absolutely doomed ice perched high in the mountains. Researchers even debate how this ice field came to be at all. Since in its current configuration, it's hard to imagine how it could capture enough snow to form glacial ice. And so, even if the Arctic weren't warming faster than the rest of the planet, this area would be likely to melt within a century or two. But with many other glaciers, it's easier to see the connection between a warming planet and ice loss. Thanks to data from IceBridge and other surveys, we now have a good estimate of the current rate of loss from Alaskan glaciers, 75 gigatons a year. While airborne observations over Alaskan glaciers have provided a rich record of change in the area, those efforts are now augmented by NASA's newest ice measuring tool, ICESat-2. With six laser beams of its own and orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, the satellite will carry on the record of Alaskan change. For their part, Chris and his team will continue to do their surveys for at least the next two years, helping to validate the ISAT-2 data and make further detailed observations over the stunning glaciers of Alaska. And now, marine weather around Alaska. For the Marines, we'll start off with a look at our ice edge. Out along the Arctic coastline between Ukiagvik and Prudhoe Bay, we still have some thicker ice there. It is continuing to diminish, however, and by the end of the week, we expect that to be more moderate in concentration than the more full coverage that we're seeing right now. As we look down into southeast Alaska, starting in the inside waters, southerly winds 10 to 15 knots strongest as we get further to the north. Out over the Gulf, we have southerly winds 10 to 15 knots in the eastern locations, and then as we get further to the north, dropping down to around 5 knots. On Wednesday, pretty light winds out over the Gulf once again, nothing higher than 10 knots. Southerly up in the northern portions, becoming more easterly as we get down the coastline. In the inside water, southerly winds 5 to 10 knots in the south, getting up to as high as 15 knots as we get further to the north. On Tuesday, starting out over the Gulf, southerly winds, 5 to 10 knots. That's going to be true in Prince William Sound as well. Around the Barren Islands, however, some gap flow winds are going to be a little bit stronger out of the west, 30 knots. Seas as high as 7 feet west of the Barrens. Then up into the Cook Inlet area, southerly winds around 10 knots. On Wednesday, flow becoming more westerly in Cook Inlet, still around 10 knots. And flow still pretty strong out of the west for areas around the Barren Islands out of Kamishak Bay. Uh, 25 knots is expected there. Seas as high as 6 feet. In the remainder of the Gulf, southerly winds 10 to 15 knots and 10 knots in Prince William Sound. For Tuesday for the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, around Kodiak Island, westerly winds 25 knots is expected. Winds will diminish as we move further to the west, but remain in that westerly direction, 20 knots for the Bristol Bay area, and then 15 knots as we get north of Cold Bay. On Wednesday, continuing to be westerly throughout the whole area, uh, 15 to 20 knots most locations, a little bit stronger east of Kodiak Island, getting up to as high as 25 knots, seas as high as 6 feet. On Tuesday, out over the Aleutians, starting off by the eastern Aleutians, westerly winds 10 knots, switching and becoming easterly as we move further to the west, 10 to 15 knots there. That's going to continue out by the western Aleutians as well, with seas as high as 7 feet, highest by the western Aleutians. On Wednesday, continuing to see easterly winds out by the western Aleutians around 20 knots, dropping down to 15 knots by the central Aleutians, and then to 10 knots by the eastern Aleutians, where the direction will eventually switch over to become westerly. Along the west coast of the state, southeasterly winds 10 to 15 knots up north by the Norton Sound area and uh, St. Lawrence Island. So you drop down the coastline at around 20 knots by um, 
Nunavik Island and St. Matthew Island, and then 15 knots by the Pribilof Islands. On Wednesday, we're going to be out of the westerly direction, 10 to 15 knots along the coastline, till we get to the Pribilof Islands, where we'll see southerly winds, 10 knots there. Along the Arctic coast, easterly winds, 15 to 20 knots, becoming up to as high as 25 knots west of Wainwright, and then down the west coast of the state, southerly winds, 15 to 20 knots are expected. Seas as high as 5 feet, highest by the Bering Strait. Then on Wednesday, staying along the west coast through the Bering Strait area, westerly winds 15 knots is expected. Variable winds around 10 knots up the west coast until we get north of Point Lay where we'll start to see easterly winds around 15 knots. And then northeasterly winds as we get further east along the Arctic coastline, still around 15 knots. For tonight, from the remainder of our weather, we do have high pressure out over the eastern Aleutian Islands, extending that region out over the Bering Sea and the rest of the Aleutians, resulting in fog throughout those areas. Much of that will mix with rain as well, and that rain is going to extend into southwest Alaska. We'll start to lose the fog as we move further inland, but still going to see showers throughout some areas around south central, especially in the mountains and southern locations of the interior. Up along the west coast, going to continue to see fog through the Kotzebue Sound area and more fog as we get along the Arctic coastline. Way down in the Panhandle area, expecting to see some lighter showers through tonight. As we move into Tuesday, those showers are going to pick up in the Panhandle area, expecting to see more widespread rain on Tuesday. And then we're going to see more rain throughout much of mainland Alaska, some extending further into the south central area, but all along the west coast. In the interior, we're going to see some thunderstorms, especially in the central and eastern locations. And those thunderstorms are going to reach south into the Alaska Range and Talkeetna Mountains, with a chance of seeing some thunderstorms south of the Talkeetnas. Down into the Bering Sea and Aleutians, going to continue to have high pressure dominating the area, resulting in more fog for the Bering Sea and for the Aleutians, with some areas of rain mixing in for the Aleutians in some areas of the Bering as well. Finally, as we move into Wednesday, that high pressure is going to continue to remain out over the Bering Sea, resulting in continued fog through the Bering and for the Aleutians, mixing with rain for the Aleutians in eastern portions of the Bering Sea. We're going to also see some rain in southwest Alaska, extending up the west coast and through southern mainland, where we'll start to see more widespread rain for south central Alaska, and continuing to see thunderstorms in the afternoon for central and eastern places of the interior. Down in the Panhandle, we'll continue to see showers as well due to high pressure, or low pressure rather, to the north of the area. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.